Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my definitive review of the brand new Viltrox Pro AF 75mm f1.2 STM lens. This is the first lens in a new upscale series from Viltrox, and it really doesn't surprise me at all to see Viltrox getting to this place. They have really progressed as quickly in their lens design and development as any lens maker as I've ever seen before, and they really are becoming a force to be reckoned with. This lens really seems to solve a lot of previous Viltrox shortcomings and is going to be a very competitive lens, starting here on Fuji, where I've done this review on the brand new Fuji X-T5 40 mega pixel APS-C sensor, highest resolution APS-C sensor I've ever used, and, and so it definitely gave, gave the lens a good optical test, which by the way, I'll give you a little bit of a news flash, it passed without any problems at all. But beyond that, they have also are upgrading in terms of some of the uh, features that I've been looking for, um, including weather sealing and an AF-MF switch, just a little more upscale build, but they're still really competitive with their pricing, coming in at $549. So at least on paper, that adds up to a winning combination. So today we're going to give you our detailed breakdown of handling and features, we're going to look at the autofocus performance in detail, and then a really deep dive into the image quality from the lens and give you a final verdict right after a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that is now even better with the new Phantom X that is crafted from aluminum right here in Canada. It is 22% smaller and 35% lighter while still making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. You could even customize your wallet due to its modular design with accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even Chipolo and AirTag tracking integration. Visit store.phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber, and use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. So as noted, there are some build upgrades here. This is, by the way, as you can see, it is not a small lens. This is the largest Viltrox lens to this point, though I will note that as far as the weight goes, it's, it's really not much more than the very first Viltrox lens that I reviewed, which was a manual focus 20 millimeter f1.8. But we do have a large lens here that is 87 millimeters in diameter or 3.42 inches and has a 77 millimeter, millimeter front filter thread, which is large but very common and share with a lot of other lenses. The lens is 101 millimeters in length or about four inches. It weighs in at 670 uh, grams or right over 23 and a half ounces. And so it is a substantial lens and it's going to be heavy for some. So for someone like myself, you know, a full-time photographer, I didn't notice the weight of the lens really at all. Uh, I had my wife shoot with it just doing a, a little portrait sh shoot of me and, and she complained about the weight of it. And so again, it's gonna be your mileage may vary depending on how comfortable you are with slightly larger lenses, but that certainly is going to be the trade-off here. The reason for that weight comes from a couple of things. First of all, this is all metal and glass in construction. The only thing plastic here is the lens hood, which is kind of surprising because, you know, about half the time Viltrox provides a metal lens hood, the other half they seem to provide a plastic one. Maybe in this case it was one of the ways that they kept the uh, price down a little bit more. And so that's the only plastic thing here, but everything else is really, you know, very nicely made. And of course, if you look in the front, there is a ton of glass in there, a lot of of optical glass, which as we're going to see is improved optical glass. A couple of things stood out to me as being changed. First of all, in terms of the physical appearance, it is a familiar design, but now we have a pro badge and instead of some kind of the meaningless letters that are there sometimes. And then on the other side, there's a new Viltrox badge that I've not seen before. Aperture is uh, fairly typical for a Viltrox lens in that we have a stepped uh, aperture ring here which with one-third clicks and you can go all the way to one side and click over into an automatic mode where you can control it from within the camera. There is no declicked option here and so if you're looking for that for video unfortunately you're out of luck. The manual focus ring here is made of metal as everything. It is ribbed, has a nice grip. It moves very nicely. The damping is good. The weight feels good to it. However, there is a little bit of a feeling of some stepping when you're trying to do very fine tuning, uh, precision autofocus or manual focus. And so that did, did detract from it a little bit. I just felt like I would, you know, move more than just a like a linear movement. It would be more of like 
with little tiny jumps. And so, um, you know, the stepping motor became a factor as a part of that, unfortunately. But, you know, I was still able to do reasonable manual focus pulls, as you can see in this shot here. If we look inside, there are 11 rounded aperture blades, and uh, that used to be a real Viltrox weakness, just they were kind of lopsided, the blades. Fortunately here, that's really not the case at all, and so we keep a nice circular shape as we begin to stop the lens down. Uh, certainly a highlight for me personally there, and, and so that is largely preferred. Also, as noted, this does now have weather sealing, and I think there are some internal seals because there is a gasket here. I haven't seen a map of inside, but they say that it is uh, dust and moisture sealed, and they also talk about an anti-fouling co coating on the front element, probably something similar to flooring, and so that makes it both resistance to water and then oils from fingerprints makes it easier to clean. And so definitely moving upscale in terms of our overall uh, build here, and one thing that has been retained, which I think is a great feature and that is a USB-C port on the lens mount that allows you to do firmware updates right through a computer onto the lens itself. So when it comes to the build here, it is a very nicely made lens and it handles nicely and I always love having that AF-MF switch. To me it remains the single most logical way to control that function. Now speaking of autofocus, this has a lead screw type STM motor. Now you know, many manufacturers are finding as they move a little bit more upscale, a little more daring with their lens designs, that they need more torque than what just the basic STM loader or maybe even a single linear type motor can provide. Uh, you know, I think the Viltrox is going to have to come to that same conclusion because while this le this lens autofocus is fairly good for the most part, um, if you're doing minor focus changes, it's it's snappy, it's you know relatively quiet, focus is smooth. But what I do miss out on seeing is that um, I. I, I find that major focus changes are not as fast as what I would like. You can tell that the lens needs a little bit more torque, and you can see as I shift from subject to subject, there's a little bit of lag there. I could also see that, for example, if I did my hand test, and uh, you can just see that it takes a little while before focus moves off my hand back to my eye and vice versa. Likewise, when I did video focus pulls, I saw a fairly smooth transition, but I also saw a little bit of pulsing before it settled, and that also can be a um, kind of evidence of not enough torque and so it's not just the speeding up end it's also the braking end and coming to a stop at the proper place without any kind of need for further movement so I think that is the area that needs improvement now on the plus side uh, the focus accuracy was actually really good from the lens I got very good IAF focus results and for example the shot of Ferrari you can see even at f1.2 how beautiful the eye is focused and then from my portrait session um, even though my wife is not at all familiar with Fuji when it comes to their focus systems uh, that um, I was, because IEF worked well, we were able to get well focused results and so at f1.2, f4, I had her shoot at a variety of uh, large apertures, f2, um, you know, we had really good focus results and as you're probably getting a preview, this is a very sharp high contrast lens. And so when it comes to autofocus, the one area where I would say forget about it. For portraits, no problem. For most general purpose photography, no problem. For weddings, you know, I, I wouldn't be 100% confident. I would like to see a little bit more torque for that. But definitely for sports, if you have moving action, um, and so in this case, as you can see, this even Nala just walking towards me, I wasn't able to nail focus consistently enough, which makes me question a little bit, for example, of you know a bride walking down the aisle. Now, if you're using this for wedding work and you're using it for pose stuff, or you know, very small movements, no problem. But I wouldn't use this personally for my critical shots of a bride coming up the aisle or something to that effect. So at the end of the day, some mixed, really the only place I find any kind of mixed bag for this lens really is when it comes to the autofocus. Because as we're going to see, the image quality is exceptional. And I knew it would be exceptional from the moment I saw the MTF that showed incredible sharpness and contrast in the center of the frame with only a slight dip at the edge of the frame and then at F8, perfect performance. And so we'll dive now into the image quality and see if it lives up to those fabulous MTF charts. So let's start by taking a look at vignette and distortion here. So first of all, as you can see from the uncorrected raw image on the left, there is no is issue at all with distortion. It is basically completely free of distortion. Uh, you can see, however, there is some serious darkening towards the corners, some fairly heavy vignette. We'll take a look at manual corrections. 
So in this case, I've done nothing to distortion as because there's no need for it, but I have dialed in a lot of a vignette correction, about three and a half stops, and uh, moved the midpoint over to get a clean result. Now, interestingly, there is a correction profile here that I don't think does enough work, but you know, as you can see, it it definitely helps. I think the uh, vignette would need to be cranked up a fair bit. And so uh, for my chart test, I don't necessarily love the end result. However, if we take a look at a real world image uh, at f1.2 with you know snow in the corners, which usually to me is where vignette shows up the heaviest. In this case, I think that the profile without any tweaks to it has actually done quite a good job. And you can see that the, the uh, corner looks very neutral. I don't know that I often see Viltrox lenses getting correction uh, profile corrections like this, so it's really pleasant to see this end result. The byproduct is, is that I don't think that real world vignette is going to be an issue because the camera profile seems to be a, doing a good job of taking care of it. Likewise, there's a very, very good control uh, here optically of any kind of longitudinal chromatic aberrations. And so you can see very, very little fringing. This is a near apochromatic result. You know, as a byproduct, we have got, you know, really, really crisp uh, resolution and dark lines there. Taking a look at some real world examples here, you can see that even on the bokeh, there is a little bit of fringing there. But basically, the only kind of fringing that you're going to see when looking at it, um, you know, at 100% magnification, like here, I see very little. And we'll also just take a look at the bokeh quality. There's only a little bit of an inner line there for the most part. This is a really, really clean and geometry, not too bad. You know, it goes cat eye towards the edge of the frame, but overall, as we saw earlier, uh, pretty good result. So the combination of really, really doing a great job of controlling uh, chromatic aberrations, on tunal chromatic aberrations, and then, you know, having very high resolution and contrast is that this is a near apochromatic performance here where, I mean, the pop at f1.2, that is just spectacular. And, and as you can see, moving off towards defocus, we don't really see any kind of fringing here at all. It is very, very nice transitions, even on these bright, shiny objects. Here's another F1.2 shot of um, my wife's glasses there just sitting on a side table. But you can see, once again, what an amazing job it does of just producing really, really crisp detail um, and very high contrast even at uh, F1.2. And we can see here, this is a, a place that's begging for chromatic aberration. And there is just a tiny, tiny bit of fringing there. Overall, a really spectacular result on that front. Likewise, when it comes to longitudinal chromatic aberration, we can see here stop down to about F8. Very often on my chart when I'm stopped down, you can really see a lot of fringing on either side from lateral chromatic aberrations. This is completely neutral here, a really strong performance. This applies in the real world too. This is the kind of scene that is just begging for lateral chromatic aberrations, um, you know, bright contrast, the snow there, and there's just no fringing that is there. You can see this turkey trying to get away from me because I was getting too close. And, uh, and anyway, just a really, really fabulous real world result. So this is my first review on the new Fuji X-T5, which has a 40 megapixel uh, APS-C sensor, which is the highest resolution that I've ever seen by a fairly good margin on an APS-C sensor. Despite that kind of torture test and showing you the results at 200%, you can see in the center of the frame, this is just a fantastic result. Amazing detail and contrast. Mid-frame looks fantastic. Very, very high resolution, very high contrast. And down here in the corners, um, even though there is a, you know, it's not completely perfectly resolved here. Actually, it's almost like there's a little dip here because the, the very edge of the frame looks just fabulous. So stopping down to f1.4 gives us a little bit of boost in the, the corner and I would say a little bit more contrast. Moving on to F2, and by F2, our corners are looking really, really crisp, you know, resolved very nicely, and we've kind of lost a little bit of that slightly nervous quality uh, that was there before. We can see a pretty huge uptick here over on the left side. You can see how crisp everything looks here on uh, Sir Winston there. So past F2, um, it's going to be more about depth of field. I think we're pretty close to tapping out the top of the potential for resolution here. And, and so if we look back here, I mean, back in the familiar territory, I mean, it looks fabulous. But in some ways, I think F2 actually looks a hair better than F2.8. Likewise, moving on to F4, I just don't see any uh, greater improvement myself. So F2 is kind of a killer aperture here if you're wanting performance across the frame. Now, if we step down into the very corner, you know, there's, I would say, a little bit further improvement there. But for the, for the most part, you're going to get, you know, fairly even performance from F2 through about F8 with the corners looking the best at F5.6 and F8 in terms of just general consistency. 
Now by F16, our minimum aperture, you can see that diffraction is starting to just soften some of the contrast. It still looks actually fairly good, but we can just see, particularly if we look in the center of the frame where it is you know, so awesome wide open, that you're losing a fair bit due to diffraction by F16. So again, I would probably use somewhere around F8 if you're using like the new X-T5 as an upper limit, and then F11 on some of the lower resolution bodies. This plays out really, really nicely for portrait work. Here we have at f1.2. So first of all, just take a look at the general rendering of the lens. You can see that the transition to defocus, the colors, everything is really, really nice. Skin tones looks, look very good. And you can see that even at f1.2, there is wonderful detail. And so this is a very compelling portrait lens. Here is uh, f1.4, and in this case, I've, you know, I've played with the tone curve a little bit for a certain look, but you can see just how much, you know, detail is there at f1.4. You know, when you're shooting in kind of the general area where you're going to shoot portraits, that kind of two thirds of the frame, this is an amazingly crisp lens, but it also has really, really nice bokeh. The shot I alluded to earlier of Ferrari, you can see at f1.2, depth of field is very, very shallow here, but you can see, number one, how well-focused it is on the eye, but then you can just see how great of detail and contrast is there. I mean, you can see the, the door reflected there um, in his eye, just a, a tremendous amount of detail that is captured. Now, in shooting landscapes on a shot like this, obviously, depth of field is going to, you know, affect uh, where focus is going to be. But you can see that even at f1.2, we've got lots of wonderful detail here. And even as we resolve towards the distance, it's doing an amazing job. Here in the foreground, obviously, things are out of focus. But, I mean, it's capturing a tremendous amount of detail across the frame, even at f1.2. If you stop on down to like f5.6 as we've got here you can see the images it just pops i mean it's you know it's drawing beautifully off into the distance there beautiful contrast really really nice color and that detail is just consistent you know right from edge to edge now, as noted, minimum focus distance remains a Viltrox weakness, and so you can't get particularly close, right under 90 centimeters, and uh, here we can see that the uh, it's only a 0 0.10 times magnification. However, it is boosted by the fact that the lens is just so good, um, you know, optically, and so, you know, plane of focus seems to be fairly flat here, and we can see really good detail and contrast, which means that the lens is still useful. I just wish it had a higher magnification level. I was very impressed with the bokeh from the lens considering how sharp and high contrast it is. And so you can see here that, you know, obviously the subject really pops at f1.2. And even though this distance wise has the potential of being a very busy scene, the rendering is quite nice. And if we go to, you know, easier subjects, again, we can see the detail where focus is, is really great. And then the, the bleed off, you know, the transition towards defocus, just really, really nice. You know, here's a more optimal situation. And so again, detail and contrast, everything is really crisp in that transition, no kind of haze or blur towards the edges. But then in this situation, we've been able, to, been able to completely blur out the background, very nice and soft. Here again, you can see some of the snowflakes in the air uh, being rendered as bokeh. It just looks really, really nice, very soft and creamy. Now, in times past, I have found Viltrox colors sometimes to not be my favorite to process, just a little bit, you know, a little bit go garish a little bit more easily. The optical glass here, I think, is definitely improved. And so as a byproduct, here you can see compared side by side with a Fuji lens, the new 30 millimeter f2.8 macro, um, you can just see that really the colors are quite consistent between the two lenses. And I would say that I would call the Fuji colors ever so slightly richer, but, you know, truth be told, they are very, very similar. And of course, the, you know, the Viltrox is easier, <laughs> easily the sharper of the two lenses at f2.8. But I think that color, and I just speak kind of generally, I found like colors were easier to process, uh, skin tones were good. I was just happy with the end results. Finally, a quick word on flare resistance. Now for real world flare, you know, like for example, this morning shot, there's no ghosting artifacts here. Obviously no problems there. Uh, and this backlit issue, uh, image with, you know, bright sun in the frame. Again, I don't see any issues, maybe a tiny bit of veiling here, but this also could just be uh, some defocus. Uh, you can see that it's held up really well against that backlight condition. However, if I shine a flashlight, like a high-powered flashlight into it, as with most lenses, it uh, it's going to react in extreme ways. Um, and here is a 
you know, this is a maybe a little bit more typical as I moved around and tried to find some ghosting blobs. You can see I got a couple of little ghosting blobs here. But overall, I think for most, you know, not extreme real world work, you're probably not going to have too much of a problem with flare. And so as you can see optically, this lens is a real treat, which makes it a real treat as a lens. At this price point, this is very, very strong optical performance. And that near apochromatic uh, performance makes this feel like much more expensive glass that I've used in the past. And again, it speaks to me of how they have upgraded the optical glass that's used in the Pro Series. It makes me very excited about what is yet to come from Viltrox in their new Pro Series. But I'm also excited about this lens itself. I really love this focal length about 115 millimeters. I feel like this is an underutilized range for lens makers, the 100 to slightly over 100, 100 millimeter range, because, you know, it's a, it's a little bit more compression than what 85 millimeter option offers, but it's not as long as 135 millimeters, which can feel restrictive sometimes. To me, this is a real sweet spot that I think more lens makers should explore, and I'm really glad that Viltrox has done that here. At $549, if you have a Fuji camera and you're looking for a great portrait lens, lens. Frankly, I haven't seen a better portrait lens uh, from Fuji at this point that I would recommend over it. And I personally would take this over either the 56 millimeter f1.2 or the 90 millimeter f2 because I just feel like it's a more appealing package overall. And of course, it comes in at hundreds and hundreds of dollars cheaper. At the end of the day, that makes the new Viltrox uh, Pro AF 75 millimeter f1.2 a real winner. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you look in the description down below, you can find linkage to my full text review. You can also find uh, links to my image gallery and check out more photos. There are buying links there, some of which are just being populated because this is a brand new lens. Um, but there, there's also linkage to follow myself and, or Craig on social media to become a patron or get channel merchandise. Check out uh, Let the Light In TV, our sister channel, for more great reviews there. Thanks for watching. Have a great day, and let the light in.